my mom has been very unsuccessful at getting rid of me. <laughs> when I was born, my foot got caught in her rib cage, presumably in a desperate attempt to cling to the security of the womb. <laughs> and after a dutiful 18 years of parenting, she thought that she got rid of me, but I followed her to college, even onto this stage to dishonor her big day today. <laughs> Why do I stick so close? I stick so close because I want a few more opportunities to learn from the two most godly and loving people I know. My mom has taught me what it looks like to be a biblical parent, a loving spouse, and a faithful friend. So it's with great joy that I would like to introduce, from the class of 88, my mom, Lisa Maxwell. <laughs> trouble when both of them were going to be up here on the platform. Yeah. Cinder asked me to speak for this chapel in, I think, March, and when she did, I laughed at her. After my public speaking class sophomore year at Wheaton, I vowed I would never, ever speak in public again. I also laughed because I don't have a dramatic testimony. Mine is a testimony of long obedience in the same direction. My parents and my grandparents were all strong believers in Christ. I was taken to church my first month of life, and I think I've been there just about every week since. My testimony is more about God's goodness and faithfulness and mercy than about anything I have done. So I began to think about the scriptures that have been important in my life those Ebenezers, those stones of remembrance, or signposts of God's faithfulness. My freshman year of high school, my small Christian school hired a new Bible teacher, Mr. Fran Shaka. He was an ex-hippie, <laughs> by far the coolest teacher in the school. He had been a marijuana-smoking, hard-drinking member of a rock and roll band who became a Christian went to seminary, and dedicated his life to teaching. He was different from any teacher we had ever had. His first year, he had to commute about an hour each way. When his family finally was able to move, his wife and two boys, his wife was pregnant with twins, and she got put on bed rest almost immediately. Several weeks later, Mr. Shaka ruptured his Achilles tendon while playing basketball. He spent the rest of the year teaching us from his wheelchair. As high school students, we watched it all. Never once did Mr. Shaka complain. He gained credibility with a group of cynical, critical high school students who thought they knew everything there was to know about the Christian life. Sophomore year, we had Mr. Shaka for New Testament survey. First thing he did was to tell us that we were going to memorize Matthew 5, all of it and he was serious. I can still hear Mr. Shaka's voice when I read Matthew 5. <laughs> that year, Matthew 5:16 hit me and began to give me a purpose for my life. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I came to Wheaton with at least one lofty goal, actually two. I vowed I wasn't gonna get married. My parents had gotten married the week before my dad had to take his senior comprehensives. Seniors, be glad you don't have to do that anymore. My sister got married after her junior year. I was not going to get married. I wanted to be a light in God's kingdom, and I wasn't sure that marriage helped that goal. So, <laughs> stop me if you've heard this before. During orientation, I met this guy. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember meeting him during orientation, but he says we did, and he has such a good memory for names, I can't argue with him. 
Our first date was in October. He called me on a Thursday night to ask me out on Friday. But hey, better late than never. <laughs> we went to see a movie, Gremlins. <laughs> and then he took me to that Wheaton date hotspot. No, not Los Burritos. <laughs> Baker Square. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, the movie was awful. And I hate pie. <laughs> He decided on our second date to marry me. Although thankfully he didn't tell me that at the time. <laughs> Few weeks later, he got my ring size. I was not so sure, but he was very persistent and eventually won me over. One of my biggest struggles during college, <laughs> I'm afraid to ask, <laughs> was I wrestled with Luke 12, 48, which says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I grew up in a doctor's family. We had a very comfortable life, but my parents taught me that everything I had belonged to God. I knew I had been given much materially and needed to use whatever I had for God's purposes. I also understood that I had a spiritual heritage that had been passed from generation to generation. The combination of these material gifts and spiritual heritage scared me. I was scared to death that God was going to ask me to do something more than I could do. My grandfather, Joseph Maxwell, died in 1985 during my freshman year at Wheaton. I think that's what prompted me to start thinking about that spiritual heritage. Grandfather Maxwell had been a medical missionary in the bush in Ethiopia in the 1920s. What was God calling me to do? And how did it fit in with this new relationship that was developing with Phil Riken? One of my vivid memories is freshman year, sitting in the basement of Fisher East on the floor and talking through what that verse meant and talking through my fears. We didn't resolve my questions at that point. And that one conversation it took a long time to resolve. In the fall of 1985, Phil was a member of the Orientation Committee. Their theme verse was Jeremiah 29 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That was the first time I had ever heard that verse, and it had a profound impact on me. It taught me about God's sovereignty. Slowly, my struggles subsided. I did not need to worry about the future because God already knew what the future held. I could be hopeful, trusting that he would prepare me for all he was calling me to do. All I needed to do was trust God and be faithful in my calling at that point, which was being a student. In a move that shocked most of our classmates, shout out to the class of 1988, Phil and I got engaged sophomore year. We got married before the summer before senior year. Yes, just like my sister did. Don't ever tell God the things you won't do. <laughs> just for the record, we were not the first couple in our class to get married. We were the second. <laughs> As we set up our apartment in college court apartments, we hung Jeremiah 29 11 on our wall. That verse has really been our marriage verse for the last 26 years. In times of uncertainty, we come to the plans God has for us, to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. The summer after graduation, we needed that reassurance. Right after graduation, we drove to Philadelphia to look for housing. We loved Wheaton, and we were very sad to leave. Somewhere on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, we stopped and prayed that somehow, someday, God would bring us back to Wheaton. We were moving to Philadelphia because Phil had been accepted at Westminster Theological Seminary. We had never been to the area, we did not know anyone, and we all really honestly didn't know what we were doing. I don't have time to go into all the stories of how God has provided, but every single time we have needed housing, God has provided in some amazing way. In this first move, we prayed that God would provide a place for us, and he used a misprint in the newspaper to allow the apartment that we ended up being in to be available when we were looking. Shortly after we moved, 
Phil returned to Wheaton to attend the funeral of a classmate of ours from Wheaton. I was alone in a strange city. It was 105 degrees outside, and we were living in an attic apartment with no air conditioning. We didn't have furniture because our moving van was three weeks late, and I learned that my Illinois teaching certificate did not transfer to Pennsylvania. I began to seriously question what God was doing. Was this the right move? Why had God taken us to this place? Sitting on the floor of a hot, empty apartment, my eyes came to rest again on Jeremiah 29:11. It was one of the few possessions we had brought with us. God gently reminded me that he is in control and I needed to rest in his plans. We spent four years in Philadelphia. We worked hard. We made wonderful friends. We got job experience. We earned two master's degrees, but I never learned to like Philadelphia. In my mind, it looked like this. <laughs> At the end of semin seminary, we had another opportunity to trust God's plans for us. We had a job offer from the church we attended, but my father and others kept pushing Phil to get a PhD. My dad went to school, to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. During their time in Philadelphia, my parents attended 10th Presbyterian Church. Multiple times, my dad said, Phil, you need to get a PhD so that you can be at a church like 10th. Since Phil spent many summers in Oxford with the Wheaton in England group, he loved the idea of studying there. So in the summer of 1992, we moved to England. One of the most difficult experiences of my life occurred there. During the birth of that first child, <laughs> I had some serious, uh, even life-threatening complications maybe or maybe not caused by that foot. <laughs> the night after his birth, I was in intensive care, and Phil was not allowed to stay with me. I was there completely alone, responsible for this tiny new life, and feeling awful. I did not have a Bible with me, and I'm not sure that I could have focused on one even if I had. The only scripture I could remember was Matthew 5, complete with Mr. Shaka's voice inflections. <laughs> It wasn't a comforting psalm, but the Holy Spirit used it to comfort and reassure me. My new job as a mother was to let my light shine before my children and in my home. The whole time we were in Oxford, I would say to Phil, you're gonna take me back to Philadelphia. I know you're gonna take me back to, I hate Philadelphia. <laughs> it took Phil threatening to move us to Romania for me to finally decide Maybe Philadelphia wouldn't be so bad after all. Once again, God had a good plan. My dad was more right than he could have ever realized. Phil needed a PhD not so that he could work at a church like 10th, but so he could actually work at 10th. That's where we served in pastoral ministry for 15 years. Within the first few weeks of being, moving back to the city of Brotherly Shove, as we called it, Phil brought the next signpost to my attention. He was reading Jeremiah 29, 11, 29 again, and verse 7 jumped out at him, and he read it to me. But seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord for it on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Although I was grateful that Phil had a good job, and I clearly saw God's hand in taking us to 10th, I still felt like we were in a city of exile. This verse helped me settle down, choose to be content, to raise a family, and be a light in the city. It was God's plan for us, but it wasn't always easy. We spent 15 years living, working, and raising our family in Center City, Philadelphia. Four more Rikens were born in Philly, and we needed a bigger house. Housing in Philadelphia is very expensive. Once again, God provided. Parking was a pain. Education was a regular topic of discussion. We had an active drug corner less than two blocks from our house and prostitution on the corner across the street from the church. But our church was a light to the city. We were a community of believers from every background who became our family 
And as we grew to love them, we grew to love the city of Philadelphia as well. A lot of life happens in 15 years. Many good things happened, but we had wave after wave of hard circumstances. It seems like we would just come up for air from one and the next one would hit. Five years in, the beloved senior minister of 10th died of liver cancer. The impact for us was that Phil's workload increased dramatically. My brother-in-law lost his eyesight after nearly dying from bacterial meningitis. My father died four weeks after Catherine was born. One of our kids was diagnosed with a serious chronic illness. Teenage daughter of some of our closest friends died. And life continued. I still had to make breakfast and do laundry. I still had to change diapers and take children to school, which for me meant sometimes two hours in Philly traffic. I still had to help with homework. I was beginning to understand the grace that Franchaka had demonstrated to me in high school. I was helpless to change any of these situations, so I was forced to keep my eyes on Jesus for help and wisdom and strength. One step at a time, God gave me the grace to face the next challenge, and the next one, and the next one. As far as we could see, God had, had placed us at 10th for the long haul, and we loved that idea. But there began to be rumblings that maybe God had other plans. The search committee contacted Phil to see if he would be willing to be considered for Wheaton's presidency. We prayed, we waited, asking God to help us not have any agenda except his. We trusted that he had the right plans for us. Once again, God revealed those plans and allowed us to come along for the ride. Leaving was brutally painful. I will never forget leaving the pulpit where Phil was making the announcement to our church to go down and hold one of our kids who was sobbing uncontrollably in the pews. We had to say goodbye to many, many dear friends. God was answering the prayer that we had uttered so many years ago to come back to Wheaton, but it came with a price. We came back to something we knew, and yet it was also different, partly because we were different. While getting ready to move, God showed me one more verse to reassure me. I love the story of the Exodus and how God would go before his people in the cloud or the pillar of fire to lead them. God had led us in each new stage of our lives, but this time I remember that God had told his people that he would not only go before them, but he would also go behind them to protect them. The idea that God goes before us and goes behind us helped me understand that God would continue to take care of 10th Church, and that really helped ease the pain of leaving. The church was in God's hands. In so many ways, Isaiah 58, 8 sums up my life to this point. Share your food with the hungry, provide the poor wandering with shelter, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. For me, letting my light shine means serving a lot of meals, making lots of brownies, hosting many guests, washing sheets and towels, and having the joy of providing hospitality. When we faithfully serve God, he promises to be our rear guard, to go behind us, to protect us, and take care of us. It doesn't matter where we are serving him. It could be Wheaton or Philadelphia or Romania or Kenya. If we faith faithfully serve God where he has called us, he will go before us and he will go behind us. One of the most encouraging parts of coming back to Wheaton is getting to see how all the different places we have been and all the experiences that we have had have been preparation for being here. God doesn't necessarily take us where we want to go or to easy places of service, but he does use all those things to prepare us for the next thing. Here's what I want you to know and remember. You don't need to have it all worked out right now. God has the plan, and he will reveal it to you, probably one step at a time. My prayer for myself and for all of you is that for the next 25 years, or 50 years, or however long we have, until Jesus returns, that we would continue to trust God and to let our light shine in this very dark world so that men and women and children would glorify our Father in heaven. 
Thank you.